On this episode of the Risk Advisor Podcast, a global integrator's perspective on adapting to business in today's COVID environment, we talk to Securitas Electronic Solutions leadership. With us is Kevin Engelhart, appointed Chief Operating Officer in October 2019. Prior service, Kevin served as Executive Vice President for Field Operations and Enterprise Solutions, where he was responsible for the company's North America field operations, commercial enterprise sales, and Canada sales. Also with us is Nelson Barreto, who was appointed Vice President Enterprise Sales in July of 2018. He leads the National Enterprise Sales Organization, which focuses on large-scale systems integration and enterprise systems across a national and global footprint. And joining us via Skype is Doug Walsh, who is the Director of Technology Solutions and provides technical sales support. Now let's join the show. Welcome to the RiskAdvisor.com podcast. I am Jim Henry, and I am here with my good friend and co-host, Sal LaFrary. Today's topic is a global integrator's perspective on adapting to business in today's COVID environment. So Sal, we continue to talk about serious innovation taking place with respect to technologies and their implementation. Some of it has been good and some of it has been downright stupid. Uh, We both talked about this and thought it was a good idea to talk about how legitimate companies bring products to market in a time of crisis. Uh, The due diligence that should take place not always does. Ain't that the truth? um, How many times have we seen post, you know, we've seen it the most is post 9-11. We saw it after the uh, the World Trade bombing, the first World Trade Center bombings, the rush to bring equipment out, the technology out. And what do they wind up coming out with is nothing but vaporware is what we wind up getting. And, you know, it's... It's always problematic for the end users that are looking for a solution, especially in the middle of what they consider to be a crisis, and they want to knee-jerk react to it. And as we had been talking about early on, it always comes back to, you know, it would be great if somebody would actually do some due diligence on the the software or on the the hardware before it got deployed. And so that was sort of the, the impetus of trying to put together this show. And, you know, fortunately, we were able to bring in uh, our guests today. As you guys have heard and as we talked about in the introduction, today's guest we have with us in the studio, Kevin Engelhart, who's the COO of Securitas. We have Nelson Barreto, the Vice President for Enterprise Sales. And joining us on Skype is Doug Walsh, the Director of Technology Solutions. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Sal. It's great, it's great to Thank have you. somebody in to be able to talk about doing some due diligence on, on, you know, on technology before it gets deployed. But I think before we get into that, let's talk about some of the, you know, the global issues, some of the domestic issues. Um, we'll try and, you know, try and chunk this down to a bit. So let's, let's talk about domestically first. You know, and from a U.S. base, right, what approach are your clients taking to deal with COVID? So, um, Sal, thanks for the question. Um, You know, in reality, when you look back into what would have been early March, um, technology wasn't really in the forefront of uh, what was going, what what organizations uh, were really doing. It was really more about process. And the processes were driven by information that was coming in from CDC or the World Health Organization. And it was very uncharted waters, and as I think if you if you look back, the, the data was changing on a daily basis, the magnitude and the risks associated to this. So, you know, we as an organization quickly uh, developed a, 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 ta- a, a pandemic task force, and we had daily calls, and the intent of those calls were to make sure that we were protecting our customers, uh, protecting our people, and then also protecting our, our business slash brand, right, to make sure that we were doing our proper due diligence uh, related to technologies, which we'll get into. But the things that we could impact that day and the, the, the day after, we're really making sure that we were doing the right things for our people and for our customers um, and really 
trying to deem what was critical, you know, just saying that we were a critical workforce was one thing, but really what aspects or what attributes what we, on a daily basis uh, that we did were critical and uh, making sure that for those individuals that were interacting with our customers, we protected them with the proper PPE and, and things of that nature. And most uh, of the initial conversations with, with our customers were around that. They were They were more so around what are you doing as an organization to make sure you're protecting yourselves, but also going to protect us when you're inside of our environments? Subsequently, that then obviously changed into more of a technology question as, you know, just like post 9-11, um, there was just an influx of, of different types of technologies that were mostly driven just on one data point. And that data point really was just the temperature reading and the uh, understanding of what we could do um, to hopefully find one level of indication if someone possibly could be um, infected uh, with this virus. So the initial technologies that came out were very driven on things that were going to be sitting on the edge and maybe or maybe not integrated to other applications of your security app, uh, platform. Um, but really just to say, hey, we are at least doing the most minimalistic thing that we could possibly do to hopefully help protect our, our work environment. Nelson, as the, the government has started to uh, reopen, how many differences uh, have you seen in the return to work approaches in the different regions and with different clients? Yeah, it's uh, so in the United States, I think uh, I think we were seeing with the different types of solutions coming from uh, the variety of, uh, of, of different products being offered uh, globally. Our approach was really uh, around understanding what what we can offer in the United States. But as we've seen globally, there's different types of solutions that uh, that, from a from a government standpoint, didn't have the same uh, requirements or regulations or restrictions around around what they can possibly uh, offer. So, in dealing with some of our global clients, um, I think from our perspective, uh, we saw that different regions had different approaches on the different types of solutions that they can provide. So it was really a collaboration between the different regions within uh, within our organization to understand in specific country uh, if a certain product was uh, was was uh, was something that they can go to market with and if so uh, what would be that uh, what would be the enterprise solution if that was something that was that was scalable and uh, allowable in, uh, in in the United States so have you also been faced with different groups within a client that are driving the uh, back to work and technology we have I think uh, we saw a uh, within security, folks are typically uh, our primary uh, reference point and who our interactions are with. But uh, what we were seeing is that in our conversations with, the, with, with security, that they were bringing in other groups such as health and safety and legal and compliance. And, and for us, it was, it was really an educate, is, it was us educating the client on what we're seeing in the marketplace and what we're seeing from, from our standpoint and what different clients were, were uh, what their approach was and how they were how were, they were using technology uh, to get back into the workplace so it was really a collaboration but uh, for, for the most part we saw that that the security team uh, and, and, and and IT were the, were the key drivers uh, getting input from the different stakeholders within their own organization some of the things that we'd started seeing was that you had the executive level staff the C level staff, coming down and starting to force stuff down people's throats, you know, going to security, going to risk, going to legal and saying, look, we have this tech, you know, we, we have the technology. And, and Jim and I joke about it all the time because inevitably when it happened and you start digging into it, you find out that it's somebody's brother-in-law or somebody like that who developed a piece of technology and wants to get it in, you know, and, and stuff it down your throat. And as the, the, you know, from our side, the consultants, as your side is from the integrators, you know, a lot of times you have to look at that and you go, well, this may not be the right piece for you. And it's a, obviously it's a little bit harder on your side because as the integrator, you're selling something, you know, with us, we're not selling an actual product and we're giving, you know, we're giving consulting advice and if they take it, they take it, they don't, they don't. But how much have you seen in, you know, in that regard where, Clients are coming to you and talking about technology and wanting to sort of push something down. 
Uh, well, that's that's been a, a, a tremendous driver behind this. I mean, in reality, um, speed. <laughs> People trying to uh, react very quickly um, to you know this this pandemic. Uh, drove a lot of um, differences of technologies, things that weren't really truly vetted out that were going to possibly sit on the customer's network. And, you know, we go through a tremendous amount of due diligence to make sure that um, we really put a, a, a high level of rigor around our product selection. And we'll walk through that uh, a little bit later. But in reality, you know, we, 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 drive ourselves to, to a very high standard and being a SOC 2 compliant organization um, with the way that we manage data and that we manage our processes both internally and externally with our customers, we hold that same level of rigor with our, our manufacturing partners. And we want to make sure that the products we're going to put inside of our customers' environments meet certain standards. So that is one of the initial you know vetting um, of would an application fit within our portfolio. You know, there's probably hundreds of cameras or, or manufacturers that say they can do attributes of what these things do, but it's the other pieces that they don't tell you about are the ones that we really want to dig into. And, and it's not always being first. You know, there's a there's a clear delineation between bleeding edge and cutting edge, and it's okay to be cutting edge, um, but you really want to stay away from sometimes the, the pain and the suffering that goes with, you know, going fast and being on the bleeding edge of, of some of these technology launches. And so one of the things we do is really go through a, a very um, structured process to say, yes, this application um, is a fit for the need set, but it's also um, it's also functionally capable and safe to be with inside of our customers' uh, security uh, portfolio. Yeah, I would say uh, being on a number of client calls, and and as Kevin mentioned, initially it was it was, hey, what are you guys offering? What what can we put out there in an immediate uh, fashion? And um, our approach, where we kind of slow down a little bit, and I think educating the client and 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 being in numerous calls, they really they really appreciated that approach because I think we wanted to make sure that one, no one knew what where where COVID was heading to, right? Or or the time and how long COVID is going to be out in our environment. So I think understanding that if they're going to make an initial investment in technology, that it's also an invest investment that they can possibly repurpose later for different applications within their environment. So they appreciated the approach. They appreciated us looking into certain aspects, especially if uh, if, if, if it was tying into the network, what, the, what did some of the cyber restrictions and what did network look like? So um, it was it was uh, it was interesting because uh, it was it was a combination of 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 hey what what do you have to offer but then as we slowly went went through the process they understood uh, why it's so important to make the right decision and the right investment and subsequently some of the applications that were first to market um, you found out that they're they're false positives or. Uh, false negative readings um, are very, very high. They don't actually meet the expectations of, of what their, their marketing said that they would accomplish. So um, things as they've evolved, they've vetted out, and uh, it's not now, it's not just our customers are asking us for solutions that aren't just about the body temperature reading and the things that are associated to that. It's also about gathering and face masks and other things that are, an, you know, other video analytics which are actually, in reality, more core to what a lot of our partners already do. Many, many, many of our uh, solutions providers have different levels of analytics that have been used in financial institutions or retails for many years, and then they could be augmented now to have a, you know, different variations. And these are proven um, solutions, and now they have variations that will look at things like, you know, congregating of individuals or people counting or um, wearing face masks. So um, I think the combination of of what is now uh, transpiring is, is, is more of a, a, a fuller uh, and, and more trusted solution. I think one of the things you mentioned earlier, Nelly, was that, you know, with, when your clients are going out and they're buying equipment and you don't necessarily know if it's going to be applicable. I mean, one of the things that we're seeing today is with the FDA regulations, right? I, I've said this all along from the very beginning. What we're, COVID is like trying to secure a ghost. Right? Because you you don't know what you're going against. You don't know, you know, what the persistence rate is. You don't know how it's transmitted. You know, we, we know virtually nothing about it. And yet we're called in to say, hey, can you tell us, you know, you got to help protect us. 
and it's taking us into an area of both from security and you know we we had mentioned this you know a couple of times before in prior in prior conversations we're no longer looking at you know to us health and safety was trip and fall and now to all of a sudden you're looking at you you you're asking security you know people in the security industry to, to incorporate medical capabilities you know looking at temperatures looking at stuff like that and it's and it was just kind of funny because once all of this started some of the equipment that was available or it still is available needs to get FDA approval otherwise the F, as the FDA ruled back in March you can use the equipment you know we're taking the, we're taking the regulations away you could use whatever equipment you want but once this is over the equipment's no longer authorized and that that's really a problem right because that's where you get the people that come out that are looking to create the vaporware the one and dones come out sell you a piece of equipment and either the company builds up rapidly and they move on they sell and you never go find them again or they just go out of business they take the money and run so it's the valid point that you were making about you know, the one and dones with the like fda and regular regulatory issues that you're going to face yeah and it was uh, we saw a combination i mean we i think uh Overall, we looked at, and Doug, Doug will talk a little bit more about it, but we looked at over 30 different types of solutions, which covered the different spectrums from handhelds to portables to uh, walkthrough devices. And um, and it was interesting. Uh, actually, Kevin and I were on the phone one day, and we saw, uh, we saw the N, uh, NBC News, and, and they had a new solution that was coming out for the medical field. And it was actually one of the products that we had evaluated, but it was really early on. It was, uh, it was, it was a startup company, and... And it was just something that was part of our due diligence process. We wanted to make sure that, you know, from a supply chain aspect, that uh, that we're going to be able to 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 meet the demand of of the client, and also be able to service it, to install it, and service it uh, day two, and have the proper training uh, to go along with it. I think we want to. Uh, I think we definitely want to delve, delve into the product evaluation process. I think we want to get dug into the conversation here. But first, we just want to remind the listeners. That you're listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by Jim Henry and myself, Sal LaFrury. We're going to invite you to comment on our blog at theriskadvisor.com and to subscribe and follow us on our social media like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you're interested in having one or both of us speak at an upcoming event that would like us to consult with you, you can also do that through the website at theriskadvisor.com and set that up with us. So let's let's talk about the product evaluation process. And for those listening, uh, we're going to suggest that you go to the show notes on our website. You know, go to the blog, go to the show notes section, and take a look at the website. And you're going to see some PowerPoint document there uh, describing in detail what we're about to talk about now. So, um, Doug, maybe you can uh, jump in here. We've kind of uh, admitted you from the beginning, but let the, maybe we can make up some time. How does uh, Securitas go about product evaluation and research? You know, th thanks. Uh, you know, we, as we said about researching and evaluating, you know, security technology that might help with these return to work solutions, and, and particularly as we're talking about, you know, camera technology, thermal camera technology that could potentially uh, detect elevated body temperature. You know, we found right now there's probably over 150 different uh, solutions on the market. We took a very uh, deep dive into over 50 of those solutions, but we did it with a committee. It wasn't uh, just just one person. Uh, we have a product evaluation committee at Securitas Electronic Security that's made up of different uh, people within our organization. We have procurement and the supply chain team uh, taking a look at distribution channels and uh, product availability and cost. We have solution architects that pay attention to uh, product features and integration capabilities. We have our installation and service leaders looking at products. You know, what does the training material look like? How are we gonna go about doing installation and service of these? Um, and just as importantly, we have representatives from our IT team taking a look at the, the hardware and the software because we want to make sure that anything that we deploy is secure. And uh, that played a big part in the um, evaluation or selection process um, because, you know, back in 2019 with the uh, uh, National Defense Authorization Act, you know, there were specific uh, products that were banned for uh, sale and use uh, by federal agencies. Uh, and as we looked at that um, and, and steered away from Hike Vision and Dawa uh, in particular, 
Um, you know, we also recommended to to our U.S. customers that uh, that we we avoid those. Also concerned about sanctions that were put into place uh, around that that might prohibit those companies from actually applying firmware or software uh, that might have a U.S. patent and and making a future firmware updates difficult and, and potentially introducing cyber securities uh, or, or not being able to keep uh, ONVIF compliant. So there, there were things there around the NDAA Act that, uh, that, that influenced our product decision. So talk, but uh, talk, really, talk us it was through, a team of people. Let, let, talk us through um, the entire process that you go through. <laughs> All right, so you, your salespeople get a request or you know, Kevin or Nelson get a request from a client and they're talking about a specific need of a product. Talk mm -hmm. us through what's, what's the internal process you go to and how do you go through all of that? Right. Well, it, it's not just uh, looking at the technology. It's also looking at the company. Uh, we have uh, a, a number of criteria that we'll uh, put in front of uh, any product evaluation and it, relates to you know company uh, statistics, how long they've been in business, uh, maturity, longevity of the product. Uh, we look at the country of origin for uh, the, the chips that are embedded in the hardware and try to understand the, uh, the software for any cyber concerns. Uh, and then as it related to thermal cameras for body temperature detection, uh, we were looking to see is it currently five, uh, FDA 510K compliant or is that company in the process of applying for that? Um, we're also looking at uh, their advertised accuracy, and um, and then for select products that we actually want to take a deep dive into, we'll we'll obtain that unit. We'll uh, run through uh, lab testing. Um, that could be for thermal cameras or, or any other product that we want to uh, really evaluate. And uh, we have uh, you know then statistics that we record. We measure that against the uh, the advertised claims from the manufacturer, but uh, there were over 30 different uh, criteria points uh, for thermal camera detection. And uh, one of the things I just wanted to add, too, was uh, also we wanted to look at integration. Is a solution that's out there, will it integrate to a client's existing VMS system or access control system? So if it was used in, 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 in a standalone environment, it was a different solution and potentially that can be used across the enterprise and, uh, and, and integrating into the different platforms within their uh, security network. Additionally, um, some of the products as we got down to our uh, final kind of set, um, you know, possible um, applications that we would recommend to our clients, because we have monitoring centers that are 24-7, 365, and very critical in nature to both our business but also to our, our clients, um, we, we actually uh, put some of these applications within our monitoring centers to actually test against our own employee base to see uh, how they would work and what the em employee interaction with the application would look like and feel like. So not just what people were saying, we actually validated them within our offices as we went back to more of a move from a go-from-home work environment to actually an office environment as well. So, Doug, you had it, uh, mentioned a, a couple of minutes ago that uh, you've tested at this point or evaluated about 50 solutions out of the initial 150 or so that you identified. But with this changing environment, you know, with the on again, off again of, of, of openings and, and new technologies coming out, uh, you know, almost uh, daily, um, has that original list of 150 uh, changed much? Do you have uh, many in the queue now going forward? Uh, how can you speak to how you're handling that dynamic moving target? Yeah, yeah. We we actually have uh, really three offerings right now that uh, that have been working well for us. Uh, one of them falls into what I'll call a, a standalone portable category uh, from a company called Seek Thermal. Uh, their Seek Scan unit is very quick and easy to deploy. Uh, we can set up this thermal camera on a tripod. Uh, and it incorporates what's called a black body or a temperature reference device um, so that this thermal camera can can get a, a reading on a, a very consistent preset temperature as, as a reference point, And it helps with some calibration. Um, hey, the Doug, Seek Scan unit Doug, plugs into a, a laptop and it's really easy to deploy. Doug, let me ask you a question. I, not to cut you off, but 
before we get into the solutions part of it, I mean, clearly we want it. We want to hear about the solutions part, but I, I'm sitting here and I'm listening and and I'm thinking about you're a global company. What are some of the considerations on deploying that technology globally? Is there so in your evaluation of the of the product, you would mention you talked about we have you know, you're looking at the chipsets, you're looking at the software, you're looking at the hardware, you're looking at the components. Mm -hmm. Does does the factor of where that's going to play and where it's going to be deployed become part of the evaluation, or is that something that? You make the you make it the best that you can, and then go back and have to turn switches off if it can't do certain things that it's wouldn't be allowed to do in a certain country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, well, the uh, the solutions that we picked, um, you know, are NDA -A compliant, so they can be you know sold and used in the U.S. Um, product availability is going to be of concern for a global customer. You know, can we get the uh, the product? Um, is it available? Uh, we're seeing some long lead times in some of the thermal camera technology right now, but most of it is uh, able to be procured in about uh, you know four to six weeks. Seems to be about the uh, the lead time at the moment. Um, so that's something to consider. Um, and then you know collecting information, um, personal information, is something to be concerned about. Uh, the solutions that we adopted uh, tend to be more anonymous. We're not building a personal profile of of uh, an employee and, and their temperature history over time. Um, we're just, uh, you know, keeping that information more anonymous because there was some concern just about, you know, personal information collection and storage. Um, so those are all things to think about. We're hearing that now with the contract, uh, contact tracing, uh, people worrying about, you know, how much data is going to be kept and how do they identify each other and, you know, and all of that. So, yeah, yeah, you, you do run into those issues. Sal, I was just gonna, I was just gonna add on to the question about global. Um, and and our and our uh, approach here in North America was 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 concentrated on our North American client base. Um, we had we have different groups uh, globally that that we're working in parallel and also evaluating and testing uh, other solutions. Um, and what we would do is we would, you know, collaborate and, and share results and share best practices because because there are different solutions that uh, that can be utilized in different regions of uh, you know of the globe. So as Doug had mentioned, you know, here regarding the uh, NDAA in other in in Europe and and uh, and in Asia, there's those products weren't banned and and it was actually products that were ready to go to market. So speed. From that perspective, uh, because the product had already been launched and because it had already been tested, we saw different uh, we saw different clients in different regions taking um, you know selecting those those solutions and moving forward with them. So, Kevin, as the chief operating officer of this global operation, you know one of the things Doug had just mentioned was you know you, you're looking at lead time on product could be four to six weeks. How difficult is it for you when a client comes in and says? Six weeks, this is over. I need it now. You know, in reality, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were wishing it was going to be over in six weeks. <laughs> Maybe that's not the case anymore. But, um, you know, it, it is something, uh, you know, I, I think this stretched the market. Um, there was definitely some capacity issues as this was something that I don't think anybody was really prepared for, um, at least for that type of application. I mean, obviously, there's been body temperature reading devices and other things that, as we talked about earlier, um, that are core to what security integrators do. Um, but I think in, in using it in these applications and, and getting them deployed at the speed, most of them were initially startup organizations. And the bigger, larger um, VMS organizations really weren't um, weren't in the forefront of it. So when you think about your largest IP camera manufacturers and VMS organizations, they weren't part of the initial discussion. It was more of the kind of startup organizations. Um, so I think as this is, has continued to go on and the uh, adaptation of this from a client base has grown, you're now seeing um, the large organizations that we have longer history relationships with that have more throughput to be able to uh, manage the capacity of this. Um, 
look, in reality, I don't think we ever thought there was going to be, we were going to run out of toilet paper and paper towels either. But um, I think there's always a, there's always pressures when you get into these emotional environments. I'm sure we'll get over this hump. And then um, the capacity related issues associated to supply chain for these applications um, will kind of diminish and, and we should be able to have a, a, a more predictable run rate for deployment. You are listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by myself, Jim Henry, and Sal LaFrary. Uh, we invite you to comment uh, on our blog at theriskadvisor.com and to subscribe and to follow us on our social media like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you are interested in having one or both of us speak at an upcoming event or would like to consult with us, please go to our webpage at theriskadvisor.com to set that up. So we are going to now move to the third segment of solutions. We've touched a little bit on uh, on that, you know, in the first two. And and again, uh, to be somewhat uh, rhetorical to what we've talked about before, um, this is not this has not been easy. It's been uh, there's a lot of moving targets here. And and one of the most difficult things to tell a client is no. So I think that, you know, sharing uh, the processes that uh, that that. Kevin and Nelson and Doug have gone through here, um, and the visibility of that process to clients, I would think that would really enhance the, the trusted relationship that an integrator has to have with, uh, you know, with your clients. So uh, the solutions uh, go through that vetting process. So uh, what types, uh, Doug, can you go through the, the types of solutions that you've adopted for uh, body temperature detection as one of the metrics? Absolutely, you know, and as we looked at the technology that could be used for measuring external body temperature, uh, we found different form factors from handheld devices. Uh, there was a category for thermal cameras. Uh, we saw some that were uh, on a mobile cart. We also saw some that were being adopted into a, a portal format, uh, much like walking through a metal detector. Um, and what we saw value in was was being able to uh, use the thermal camera technology really to get some distance between the tester and the subject matter. Um, you know, there are a lot of handheld devices, non-contact infrared thermometers. There's even thermal cameras that are in a handheld form factor. But, but really, you know, trying to move those people apart, increase social distancing, uh, and really have a more comfortable, you know, experience uh, was what we were after. So we migrated to the thermal camera technology uh, as a potential solution. And uh, we found that we could get an accurate reading when they're set up properly and, and uh, calibrated and configured the way they should be and, and used um, following the guidelines that FDA put out, uh, which we'll talk more about here in a bit. Uh, they could be as effective as a handheld uh, thermometer could be. And we didn't end up with just one solution. We, we found several uh, for different needs. Uh, the first one being, as I mentioned earlier, the, the Seek Scan, the, the standalone portable solution. Um, it was very quick and easy to deploy the camera on a tripod. And as I mentioned, this black body, this temperature reference device used for really uh, some calibration, uh, a reference point for the camera to know um, what that preset temperature is. We'd set the black body to 100 degrees. The camera would have that as a reference point. And then we could, you know, uh, have something to measure against as, as somebody stood uh, on the mark about five feet away and uh, we took a, a measurement. We could get then a pretty good read on uh, their external body temperature. Seek scan was uh, really easy. Um, it simply plugs into a laptop with a USB cable, loads some software, simple pass-fail interface. If your temperature is below the uh, the defined threshold, say it's you know 100 degrees, uh, it, it flashes green. If we detect elevated body temperature goes over that threshold, it would flash red and, and make an audible alert. So very uh, simple system to use. Um, and that was uh, what we called the standalone portable solution. Um, we also created uh, another one that was a little more versatile. Um, we partnered with a company called Mobotics. We liked their camera just because it had integration capability, as, as Nelson mentioned. You know, we had customers that wanted to record the video stream, that wanted to maybe give consideration to connecting to access control. Uh, within the unit itself, it had a little red-green LED that we could program to, to light depending on the temperature reading. 
It also had a built-in microphone and speakers, so somebody could be, you know, listening and talking uh, through the camera. Um, it could have outbound email and text messages, so it was just very flexible and uh, configurable, and so we like that uh, with the Mobotic solution. And then the other category was using FLIR cameras uh, that were already FDA 510 clay cleared, and then coupling them with some software uh, from a company called Viper Vision or SmartLX. These are companies that have used thermal cameras uh, for years, usually uh, in outdoor applications, measuring critical infrastructure, oil and gas. These, these cameras could detect uh, slight temperature deviations, and so you know, the cameras were tried and true. The software uh, was pretty mature. It was just modified and uh, adopted to now taking external body temperature readings. So we had not one, but, but several different solutions depending on our customer needs. So clearly you're indicating the importance not only of the product selection, but in setting the environment to, uh, to be able to increase the accuracy. And it sounds like that's even more important when you you know, attempt to do this uh, in, a, in an outdoor environment. Would you say that, that outdoors is still a more challenging application than uh, in an indoor or lobby environment where you have more control of the factors? Yeah, ab absolutely. And, um, you know, we, we look to the uh, some ISO and IEC standards that were actually developed for the use of, you know, thermal cameras for temperature detection in this scenario. And, you know, there were some guidelines there that, that we want to follow really testing one person at a time. Um, we want to use a, a black body or temperature reference device in the camera field of view to get the, the most accurate reading. Um, and it needs to be set up and, and calibrated so that it's uh, accurate. And, and if it is done properly, um, you know, we're seeing results on some of these systems that are within, you know, plus minus 0.3 degrees Fahrenheit of, of a handheld uh, non-contact infrared thermometer. So they can be as accurate as the thermometer. Um, and the distance between the subject matter and the camera can vary depending on the solution. Uh, the seek scan portable unit, uh, you're about five feet from the camera to the uh, subject matter. Um, robotics uh, can go a little bit further. Um, the, the, using the FLIR cameras with the Viper Vision or SmartLX software, the read was actually a lot closer and really those software applications are really keying in on the, the uh, inner eye duct or the medial canthus, as it's called, of the eye, where we're going to get the closest reading to core body temperature. And so using some video uh, analytic software, we key in on that portion of the eye, we get the most reading or the most accurate reading, but to, again, a, a lot closer read range to get that kind of resolution and that kind of accuracy. Um, but they should be used indoors. We, we need a controlled environment. Uh, temperature matters, humidity matters, uh, lighting matters. I want to make sure that we've got a very stable uh, you know, environment. I uh, want to have a, a solid backdrop. Don't want to be looking out uh, through the window. Um, and we've also been following some recent uh, guidelines that FDA published on how to set these up, uh, distance, um, lighting, and uh, height of the camera, it all sounds, things that are making it accurate. It, it sounds a lot like a, the early versions of facial recognition, the same issues that we, that we saw then where you needed to have proper lighting, you had to be within certain tolerances of angles of the person. Absolutely. All of that matters. Uh, you know, again, that the best reading will always be, if, if, if the software will support it, the, the inner canthus of the eye. Um, you know, other solutions we found aren't able to pinpoint that and are just going to go for the hottest uh, portion of the uh, face. But, uh, but all of the solutions we looked at are, are really trying to key in on, on that headshot and uh, get an external body temperature reading, um, you know, on the, uh, on the forehead or the eye if uh, the software supports it with analytics. So when going back to, you know, post 9-11 and, you know, the big rush to a lot of perimeter detection systems and whatnot and, you know, in the, you know, in the decades I've spent as an integrator, you know, we always knew that, that a combination of technologies, of triangulating technologies was a much more effective way to reduce uh, nuisance alarm rate and uh, false alarm rate and increase accuracy. And I think the same principle holds here for now for, uh, for COVID detection. You know, temperature is one element, 
But I think as, uh, as time evolves, and Doug, would you agree, we're going to see more uh, multi-factor elements of uh, measuring attributes that could indicate, you know, whether or not uh, COVID is present, and then furthering that into integration with other systems so that, um, you know, uh, COVID or in COVID in particular, or just health metrics uh, are going to become one of the uh, multi -fact multiple factors that are considered, you know, when we look at access control systems and decisions that are made on solutions for uh, allowing people into certain areas? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, contact tracing being a big element, uh, using access control systems now to track, you know, where people are going and, you know, if they are found to be uh, you know, ill, we could then go back and run custom reports to see you know, where that person was and who they came in uh, proximity to. Uh, we're seeing the same thing uh, with video analytics using facial recognition to do some contract tracing reports there as well. And uh, we're also adapting the software for PPE detection, you know, to detect if somebody's were wearing a face mask. Uh, video analytics also being used for social distancing. So, you know, it's easy for the software to measure the distance between moving objects we could potentially activate an alert if we've got a, a group of people standing too close together. Uh, and the final one would be uh, just in occupancy counting. It's uh, not difficult to take the technology that we've got and um, you know, train it on a room and, and do some people counting. And you know we're seeing some solutions that will actually uh, give us real-time displays uh, you know, for the occupants themselves to, to see, uh, you know, you know, how things are, you know, coming and going and uh, if we exceed an occupancy count. So, uh, yeah, the video analytics is play, playing a role here in some of these return to work tools. And uh, Jim, to your point in both Sal, you know, Sal mentioned facial recognition. And when, and when you think about these applications, um, for the most part, the initial introduction are, are all sitting on the edge, right? They're usually in the lobby or most, most, of, most of the time in the lobby. And just like the, you know, um, the introduction or, or the advancement of, of the biometric, right? And, and, you know, we talk about where security technology has gone and why do I need a card if I have a fingerprint or, you know, a facial recognition or something of that nature. And with that um, expansion of the technology, the obstacle, obstacle becomes throughput. So ultimately, there's going to be this push-pull dynamic where, yes, we want these technologies on the edge. But, you know, as people do, you know, go back and the purpose of them is to be able to allow people back in the workforce, back into the office environment. Now, when you start to bring, you know, a thousand people in all at nine o'clock in the morning into a lobby in New York City or uh, any other large city around around the country, what's the throughput? Are you going to have people now backed up, you know, for 35 minutes waiting to get into their office environment because, it, it's, you know, we, we, the speed to market was critically important. The safety associates critically important and justifiably so. Sooner or later, you know, just like um, other, other biometrics that have, have um, been in the market for a long time, it's how do they manage the throughput? How are we able to get people into their, into their um, office environment in a very efficient manner? Um, and when you think about social distancing, the worst thing you want to do is have people congregate in a lobby waiting to get through a turnstile or waiting to get through through uh, an entry portal. So, so um, there will be additional obstacles as these technologies evolve and as the environment and the world in which we play and involve and people do go back to these um, two office locations because they're not only going to be, you know, 20 people offices in a small commercial retail space. They're going to be high rise buildings in New York City and you have thousands of people all going to work at nine o'clock in the morning. So um, it, we, did, we did a traffic study with, uh, with one of the clients that we, were, we had looked at. And if you have a million and a half square foot building, with a population of about 6,000 people coming into the building each day. It was taking about 11 and a half hours to get them, to get everybody into the building if you actually went with the social distancing requirements. And it's just 11 and a half hours to just right. get them in. Not about getting them out, get them in. So, Doug, uh, one of the real ways to minimize that, uh, that congestion model and, the, and, and chaos that can, that, can be, that can be created by rejecting people you know, at, at the entry point 
is to not have the people that will be rejected rejected and and the best way to do that is to have some means of of vetting them beforehand shortly beforehand like within you know hours or a day of you know when they're coming into a facility then that gets into you know some of the self testing or self validation and maybe some automation um, of testing being implemented by the individual so you keep the HIPAA mm-hmm. confidentiality you know are you looking at some of those systems now that are that are that are coming out to to aid in you know the in, in that self validation so that they're kind of it's almost like a pre screening pre screening for TSA and there's less uh, you know like I say there's less chance of a rejection there at the uh, at the entry point yeah, absolutely. You know, having a, a health self-assessment, if you will, could be a very important part of the process. Um, and we're working with some clients right now that have actually blended the uh, a self-assessment uh, for their employee, whether they're going to the office or even if they're working at home. We've got some clients that require that self-assessment either way. Um, but then having the a form, a checklist, a series of questions that are asked, you know, are you feeling well? Do you have a cough? Are you, are you running a fever? Other things like that or can be on the self-assessment. But then if they do go into the office, combining that with the, uh, the temperature reading um, and blending those processes together, and that's worked really well for some of our customers. Uh, we've taken our Securitas, Securistat All Clear mobile application uh, and modified that so that we have a health assessment uh, form built in. So as somebody is going in to uh, open a store, or maybe it's a bank branch, uh, they can go through that health assessment uh, questionnaire as uh, an integral part of their opening procedure. That information is stored in the cloud and made available uh, to uh, the appropriate team members. So you can see that we can kind of layer these different uh, solutions together to come up with an effective you know, return to work process. Well, I think that's just about going to wrap it all up for us. Um, Kevin, if someone wants more information on the products that, uh, that Doug had been talking about, how do we get the, how do we get them to find out more? Well, um, obviously you could reach out to us uh, via the website and then um, LinkedIn and Twitter and uh, we we're, uh, our social media pages are all updated. Uh, we've also been doing, um, with regard to, you know, so much of the world going virtual, um, we've been hosting a lot of these types of discussions with our customer or customers or anybody that's interested uh, related to new technologies. Um, and obviously, uh, thermal imaging and thermal cameras, body temperature reading cameras uh, have been a, um, one of the discussion points uh, that have come up and really driven by um, you know, our top tier customers continually asking us for the solutions that we see, you know, leading, you know, coming to the forefront of those. So uh, we're driving those discussions with our customers. We uh, record uh, those, those WebExes as well, uh, and make them available. And uh, any information or if there's any information, you can contact us in, on the website um, or uh, you can call Nelson on his cell phone. <laughs> Thanks, Hold Kevin. on, we'll give you his number to know <laughs> as Nelson climbs under the table. <laughs> Anyway, guys, we really want to thank you for coming. Uh, it was really good having you in the house. Doug, it was great having you online chatting. Um, and again, uh, you've been listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by Jim Henry and myself, Sal LaFreury. We're going to ask you to subscribe to this show and to like us on our social media sites like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you're interested in having one or both of us speak at an upcoming event or would like it to consult with us, we're going to ask you to go to the webpage, theriskadvisor.com. And let's set that up. Also, if you happen to know someone that would make a great guest, we're going to ask you to do the same thing. Go to the webpage at riskadvisor.com and make that suggestion. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, you can hear the show on your favorite podcast platform. You can hear it on YouTube. And, of course, you can stream it at theriskadvisor.com. And, again, thank you for listening, and we hope to tune in next week. Thanks. TheRiskAdvisor.com